Pastor Ben, for your kind words. I'm really honored to be here with you all this morning. Let's all stand up and have a word of prayer, please. Father, we come to your presence in the name of your Son, Jesus, who died for us upon the cross, taking upon himself all of our sins and our diseases, and by whose stripes we are healed. Father, I thank you for your word. I ask you that you would allow our hearts, Father, to receive the implanted word. Yes. Let your word penetrate our hearts, penetrate our minds. Father, increase our faith, bless us, and let our lives be for your glory that we may bear much fruit for you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Please be seated. You all hear me in the back? Yeah. You understand my funny English? <laughs> I wish I could speak like you. <laughs> well, praise God. As I said, I'm really glad to be here. I want to start by showing you what I do for a living. This is my day job. Now, I'll tell you when to switch the pictures, okay? I'll say the next picture. This is what we do, preaching the gospel of Jesus, gospel crusades, reaching the unreached. We do 10 campaigns in Africa every year, in Southern Africa. Plus, we do a couple of campaigns in India and other places every year. And, uh, and in fact, that's where I'm going right now. I'm flying out to Zambia tomorrow. And this is just a transit point for me. And we're going to have two campaigns in Zambia. And then uh, we do church planting. We have planted over 1,500 churches through our ministry so far. And it's not been done in one day, but over many, many years. And uh, training pastors, we'll actually be training pastors. We'll have about, I, mean, I think, about 300 pastors coming in for three days uh, from this coming Wednesday. So we'll feed them and take care of them and teach them for three days. And then overseeing churches. Right now, I oversee about 400 churches in Africa, in uh, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Zambia, South Africa, and Botswana. And uh, then uh, we also have a church planting school, a Bible school in Zimbabwe, and we also have an orphanage in Zimbabwe. So this is what we do. The next one is, this is Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> this is my wife, Britta. She's from Sweden. I lived in Sweden almost 20 years. So uh, by the way, uh, Pastor Ben Nedemann, I know who comes here regularly, he was my Bible school student. So many, many years ago. Anyway, this is my wife, Britta. This is when she was with me in Zambia the last time. The next picture is, this is one of my house pets in Africa. As you can see, I'm a cat person. And uh, just in Africa, the cats are bigger. And uh, this picture is real. People ask me, is this a real picture? It's not Photoshop, it's real. Everything is real. The only thing fake is my smile. Because I was really, really scared. But just to tell you what they do is, I mean, these are wild animals. So. They first teach you how to interact with lions, and then uh, then they also feed the lions really well. You know, because <laughs> a lion will only kill when it is hungry, so they feed it very very well. So <clears throat> this lion was well fed. I went to the course, then they fed me. I mean, they fed the lion, and then <laughs> that also. You know, so we went out, and but you know, lions can backslide. You know, they can be like you after a big meal. They say, I think I want some chicken nuggets. You know, so. He did turn around and look at me, but he, he realized he didn't like dark meat, so pretty okay. That's why he, lions in Africa mostly eat tourists. Uh, anyway, the next picture is, uh, this is me preaching in, uh, in, um, in the town of Chawama in Zambia. Actually, I'll be back in Chawama. I haven't been there for a number of years. And on this field, at one time, we had 30,000 people baptized with the Holy Ghost in one service. This is... Chawama in Zambia. The next one is, uh, this is Lobengula in Zimbabwe on the final night. The next picture is, this is in uh, Chipata in Zambia, the final night altar call. Next picture, please. This is in, uh, in, uh, in the township of George, uh, the final night altar call. The, last pic uh, the next picture, this is people getting baptized with the Holy Spirit in George in Zambia. And the next one, uh, this is in Ukraine, in Kharkiv, Ukraine, pretty close to the war zone where the fighting is going on. So I was there last year, I was there this year also. Um, and we did a crusade in the indoor stadium. It was very cold, as you can see, people are dressed in their winter clothes. 
inside because it's very cold in January and we, we rented the ice hockey stadium and there was no heating inside. It was minus below freezing inside. And the next one is, uh, this is uh, a crusade I did in India, which was um, in December actually. Um, and about 80% of the people who came were Hindus, Sikhs, and Muslims. It was, it was amazing because a lot of the churches there are very, very religious and they were not interested because, you know, they're, they're not, uh, you know, they, they would like a Christian concert or something, then they'd come out. And, uh, and I said, no, this is just for sinners, so they were not interested. So most of the people, so most, most of the people who came were total sinners, and I've never seen so many people born deaf and mute who were healed, uh, like in this campaign. It, it was amazing. And the uh, next picture is, uh, this is in Sangye Island, Indonesia. This was, this was an island which is very, very far, I mean, it's a far outlying island. It's actually uh, within, the, uh, within the territorial, how do you call it, you know, of the Philippines, all, because all the islands there uh, are, are, are Philippine islands. And uh, uh, we had to fly uh, several hours on a commercial airliner, and then we, we got on a ship and traveled by ship the whole day, then we came there. And this uh, town had never had an outreach before. And I was a bit antsy about where I'm going to stay because, uh, you know, I don't like rats and cockroaches and bugs, especially in places like this. But uh, we were invited by the governor. I didn't realize that until I got there, until I saw the brass band on the dock. You know, there was a big brass band playing. So I said, what is, who is this for? They said, this is for you. The governor came with the brass band. So he said, you're going to stay in my place. And the governor had, I mean, it looked like the White House in Washington. Uh, beautiful, and it was air conditioned, hot and cold water, servants, 15 course meal. So I said to guys, I said, you know, I said, this sets a new standard for how missions work should be done. <laughs> so we had a fantastic campaign, and you can see that people came, people got saved and healed, and we planted a church there. We left a team behind, planted a church, and that's thriving today. So the next one is, uh, this is Jakarta, Indonesia, as you know the world's largest Muslim country, uh, the altar call. And the next one is, uh, this, is uh, this is in the United Arab Emirates, very conservative Muslims came to the meeting, gave their life to Jesus. Wow. And uh, the next one is, uh, there's a lady who was born paralyzed and couldn't walk. Uh, she hadn't walked her whole life and she used, to, she used to get around on that cart that the ushers are holding up that you see on the right hand side, and God healed her, and she stood up and began to walk. So this is her walking. Thank you for your enthusiasm. And uh, this is from the crusade in India in December. This young girl was born deaf and mute, and here she's hearing and speaking for the first time, and the lady next to her is her mother. And the next one is, uh, this is a man who was totally lame. He suddenly got up and began to walk. This was also in India, so he came up. He came up on the platform under his own steam, as I say, and, and, uh, and gave his testimony. And the next one is, uh, this is, now this is interesting. This was, you know, I was in, in the town of Chegutu in uh, central Zimbabwe about uh, six years ago, seven years ago. And this man came to the crusade with this, with this little baby, a few months old, and the baby was born with a club foot. I mean, the foot was totally twisted, it was rolled up. It looked, the foot looked like a club, you know? I mean, the, it, it was all curled up and twisted, totally deformed. And the Lord healed the baby. So six years later, I was back in Jabutu uh, for a crusade, and he came to see me, and he brought the boy. And he took his shoe off, and the boy ran around and played, and he showed me that the Lord had healed his son. So uh, I asked him, I asked him, I said, what are you doing these days? He says, well, when the Lord healed my son, I gave my life to Jesus, and today I'm, today I'm pastoring a Pentecostal church. So he's one of the pastors. And the next one is, uh, this is a school of ministry in Zambia, because I do this on a regular basis. Uh, as I said, I'm doing one right now, so these are the pastors at that one, that particular event. And the next one is, now this is interesting, this is in the town of Zomba uh, in Malawi. Zomba uh, uh, was, a, I should say it was a Muslim city 
because more than half of the people were Muslims. The local MP was Muslim, you know, I mean, it was a Muslim town. So I did the first ever crusade in Zomba. I went to Zomba, rented the stadium, and the center of town had a crusade, and the Muslims didn't like it. But we had huge crowds come out, and many people got saved and healed, thousands and thousands every night. And then uh, I planted a church. I left this man. Now he's gray-haired in this picture, but he was a young man, fresh out of Bible school. I, I left him behind, supported him, and he started a church. Now I was back in Zomba more than 20 years later. And now he has a congregation of 4,000 people on Sunday mornings. Plus, you see, in Africa, people don't have cars and they don't have public transportation in a lot of these towns, you know. Uh, so uh, you have to, if you want to reach the city, you have to plant churches. Uh, and plant churches in the neighborhoods where people live. So he has planted a network of 26 churches that covers Zomba. And Zomba is no longer a Muslim city. It's a Pentecostal city. So this is Zomba in Malawi. And uh, the next one, and you know, uh, can, can you roll the picture back? Uh, back I want to show you. And he built this building without any help from outside. The Malawians raised this money themselves and build this church. Okay, the next one is, uh, this is our new orphanage building that we built on our farm in Zimbabwe. We actually have a thousand acre farm in Zimbabwe. So, and, it, and it, it's not one of those farms that was seized from white farmers. It's not that, because I was actually offered a farm and uh, by the government, and I, I said that, now has this been seen, seized from somebody? They say, yeah, well, I say, well, I don't want it because that land is cursed. I said, any time you take someone else's livelihood by force, I said, do you know how many Christian farmers lost their land? And uh, I said, I know there's white farmers who are, who are racist, but you indiscriminately took everybody's land. And I said, that land is cursed, and I don't want any part of it. I said this to the government, and so they were quiet, you know. But then uh, this farm belonged to a ministry that actually came and merged with us because their bishop died. And so they came to us. So we have a thousand acre farm. It is so big that if, if you go on Google Earth and you go to the city of Kadoma in Zimbabwe, just outside the town, you'll see an airstrip. It's the only airstrip in that region. And that airstrip is on our farm. So I'm the only Assemblies of God minister who has his own airport. Now, I know, I know, a, lot of, I know a lot of big shot preachers have their own planes. I don't have one. And I don't intend to buy one either, but, but nobody has his own airport. There's the only one guy who has an airport, and you're looking at him. No, no. I must qualify that. Nobody has landed there for 30 years, and I don't, I don't envision anyone landing there either, but that's another story. I tell people, if you don't believe me, go to Google Earth. You will see an airstrip on my farm. It's a tart strip. Fantastic. So anyway, so we have that... Uh, I just finished this building for our kids, and, uh, and I mean, it was an orphanage that nobody wanted. You know, somebody had started the orphanage, but the kids lived in mud huts and they were starving, and so uh, they just basically gave it to me. So what do you do when you, you know, someone gives you an orphanage, you, you take care of the kids, and, and the Lord has blessed us and blessed those kids, and they're growing up, they're loved and nurtured, taken care of, live in a nice house, and. Uh, we are, you know, we are feeding them, they go to school, and they are well taken care of. Praise God. And uh, the next one is, is the dormitory we built for our Bible school students. This is, this is, we just finished it. This will house 70 students in our church planting school because we believe strongly in church planting. So this is a uh, dormitory. The next one is, this is me again preaching in Zambia. Well. So you have not been to Africa with me? Thank you. Thank you for uh, showing the pictures, and I would like my flash drive back. When I... Okay, praise God. Let me go into the Word of God by telling you a story first of all. Do you remember 10 years ago there was a tsunami in the Indian Ocean? Remember that? Uh, a tsunami is when a tidal wave, you know, because if there's a, any seismic activity uh, under the sea, normally earthquakes are on land, but if an earthquake takes place in the sea, it releases, unleashes a tidal wave. And this wave was about, I should say, about 20 meters high, about 70 feet, and it, traveling at a speed of about 500 miles an hour. 
and it caused widespread destruction. It wiped out entire cities and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people living in coastal areas were killed. Big ocean-going ships were thrown by the tsunami several kilometers inland. Uh, and uh, the destruction wasn't just in Indonesia and Thailand, which were in the vicinity of the tsunami, but uh, even in far off places like India, and even on the east coast of Africa, there was destruction. So uh, when this happened, you know, we live in days when you can, when things happen on the earth, you can actually see it live on CNN. So as this was unfolding, I saw, I watched this on CNN, and I was horrified. I'd never seen anything like it before. And uh, when I heard about the destruction, I felt like I want to do something. And I'm sure everybody here, you, you felt like we, have, we must do something about this. We must help those poor people. So I began to think, what can I do? My first thought was, I'll get on a plane, go to Thailand or Burma, because I have churches there in Burma, and uh, do something to help the people. But then I realized, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a medically trained person. I'm not an EM, EMS worker. I'm not a doctor. Um, I don't have that kind of training. So what can I do? I've just been people's way. So then I got an idea. I'll raise some money and send the money to help those who are helping the people. So I also realized that I needed to raise some big money because the destruction was so vast, little amount, amount of money wouldn't really go far. So I wanted to give some big money. The other thing was that the money I wanted to give was much more than what I had or could afford. And also, it needed to be done quickly because when people are dying, you can't believe God that in six months or a year you'll have the money. You need the money now. Yeah. So I didn't know how to get such a large sum of money. So I went before the Lord and I said, Lord, I need some money to help these people and I need it quickly. And the Lord said, how much do you want to give? And I got a figure in my mind. $25,000. Now, I don't know about you, but for $25,000, I mean, that, that's a lot of money for, for me. That's, that's big. Now, one of my, uh, one of the things about me is that I'm not a good fundraiser. I know some preachers are such good <laughs> fundraisers that if a child swallows a coin, you take the child to the preacher, he knows how to get it out, even if the doctor has failed, you know. I, I am not good at raising money. I, I, I've never been good at raising money. It has not been my gift, you know. And so I didn't know what to do, how to raise $25,000 in a short amount of time. So, I, I, you know, I was really talking to the Lord, and, and the Lord said, uh, he, he put in my heart to just write your intentions and send an email to all your personal friends. So I did that. I wrote down my intentions. I said, my friends, you have seen this destruction. I want to do something about it. And I'm believing God for some money to send. If you can help us, please help us. And every cent will go to help, help those people. So I sent that email out. This was, this was the Lord put in my heart. And something amazing happened. My email really touched people's hearts. And they forwarded it to people I didn't know. So soon my email was all over the world. And in a very short time, in a few days, I had $170,000. Wow. Now that's a wonderful problem to have when you have seven times the money that you need and you don't know what to do with it. So I had $170,000 and I was totally blown away because I remember at one time I needed $75,000 to buy a new truck in Africa, and I had to believe God about seven years for it to come. So I had $170,000. So uh, I called a pastor. I thought of a pastor friend of mine in Singapore who has a church of 33000 So I called him because I know that his church is very engaged in things like this. Whenever something happens, he sends people there because a church that size, you know, he has doctors, nurses, engineers, he has all kinds of people. So I called him. I said, Kong, do you, are you doing something to help uh, the, you know, these people who were hit by the tsunami? He said, oh yeah, we were the first people to send medical teams there. In fact, we were there before the Red Cross. Wow. We have two teams there and we are sending some more. I said, okay, great. I said, do you need any money? 
He said, yeah, yeah, we, of course we need money. I said, how much do we need? How much do you need? He said, now wait a minute. Are you going to send me money? <laughs> I said, yes. He said, I said, why? He said, you know, normally missionaries ask me for money. And you're a missionary who wants to give me money. I said, yeah, I want to give you money. I said, how much do you need? He says, Christopher, whatever you have, fifty, hundred dollars I said, it'll be, it'll be significantly more than that. So I sat in my office and I remember when the first $30,000 went out. In all, his church got $90,000. And, um, and, and with the rest of the money, you know, we built an orphanage for 100 kids in Sri Lanka. And uh, we, we, um, we re, how do you say it? Re, um, I don't know the English word for it. We, we rebuilt an entire village of, uh, uh, on the coast of Burma that had been destroyed. A village of fishermen who had lost their livelihood. We, we, dug, we drilled water wells, built huts for them, and um, bought fishing boats and nets for them so they could get back into business, you know, things like that. So we did a lot. But I remember, that's what I want to tell you, when the first $30,000 went out, it was an, is the sound kind of going funny? Should I move it here? Huh? Is it okay? Okay. I remember when the first $30,000 went out. And sitting in my office, and there were two things I realized for the first time in my life. Because, you know, I've lived in America for many years, and I've always, uh, I, I, I've hated this extreme prosperity preachers, uh, I mean, uh, not preachers, but preaching, extreme prosperity preaching, where it's all about preachers getting rich and living in luxury, you know, talking, taking up offerings so that the preachers can live in luxury and fly private jets and drive big cars and live in palaces. Uh, I've always found that to, to be totally repugnant because now I, what, what, what they do with their money is their business, none of mine, but I don't see it as being scriptural. You know, I, I don't see greed as being scriptural. You know, uh, and uh, if, now if someone does business uh, and, and, and earns money, works hard and lives, you know, high on the hog, well that's his thing, you know. It's his money, he's responsible before God for what he does. But when, but when a preacher, he gets on TV and he says, money for the gospel, and there's widows and poor people and older people living on a pension who support him and he supports him, and with that money, he takes a big salary. Uh, 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 you know, I, I just don't like it. So I've always had a, um, although, you know, I, I was very close to Brother Hagen personally. I went to Rama, and uh, I'm a faith guy. Uh, 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 and I can tell you, Brother Hagen never believed that. He, he, he never, never, never believed that. In fact, before he died, he called all these preachers, 40 of the top prosperity preachers, and he corrected them, you know. And, um, and you see how this thing has spread like poison. Go to places like Nigeria, you go to Africa, you see preachers who live like that. Uh, you know, in countries where most of the people are poor, you see preachers are the richest people in the country, and they've gotten rich, not because of God's blessings, but by sponging off on other people. Yeah. And, and honestly, I don't like it. You know, I, I, I do not like it. So, so, but I suddenly realized one thing when the first $30,000 went out, uh, I realized that money is power. Money is a great enabler. Yes. Money in the hands, in sanctified hands, can be used to do a lot of good. Amen. Amen. I realized that. And then it brought back to me how God didn't say that money is evil, but the love of money is the root of all evil. Yeah. Money yeah. is a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's why, as our brother, he quoted the scripture, God says, I give you the power to, you know, to obtain wealth. And so money is a good thing because you can do a lot of good things with money. Yeah. And uh, you want to feed an orphan, you need money. And I remember the days in Sweden um, when I used to go to a church and I used to, I used to sit in the back and listen and they had a missionary come through and he was building, you know, doing some work in Ethiopia. Not only that church did a lot of work in Ethiopia and he needed money. And, uh, and, and I remember thinking, this guy is a good man, and he's doing a great job, and I wish I had so much that I could just write one check and pay for this whole thing without him having to take up an offering. That's how I felt. That's how my heart felt. But at the same time, because of my lack of resources, there was nothing I can do. And when that $30,000 went out, I suddenly realized 
for the first time in my life that the best of intentions cannot help people. The best of intentions cannot feed a hungry child. The best of intentions cannot save an orphan. But cold hard cash will do it. <laughs> do you understand? I hear you. Think with a cool head. The best of man's intentions cannot help an orphan. But cold hard cash will do it. So I realize that money is an enabler. It enables you to do all the good things that God puts in your heart. Yeah. The second thing I realize, how great the joy is. I mean, the kind of joy you feel when you can give away $30,000 with no strings attached and you know that money is going to help somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my heart was filled with such joy. Now, you've got to understand, I must qualify that. I was giving away other people's money, you know. I was not giving away my own money. But the fact was that money was in my hands and I could do with it whatever I pleased. But to give that money away felt wonderful. So I decided, you know, I must get rid of my prejudices against all these, uh, you know, extreme prosperity preachers. And I must go back to the scripture and, and find out what the Bible has to say about these things. Because sometimes we get so loaded down with prejudices against what, you know, people preach things and they preach wrong things. And so, or, or, or there's some people who, who do wrong things. You know, some people preach on healing and then they minister to people, but they do it with such flamboyance and showiness, and we see the showiness, so what happens? Because of that, we end up rejecting the doctrine of healing. Yes. Yeah. We don't pray for the sick, because yeah, we, I don't believe in this healing stuff, because I saw brother so-and-so on TV, and he was flashy and showy, and he did that, and so we, we end up losing out on something that is of God, that has been spoiled by somebody else. Yes. So we always need to Go back to the scripture and see what does the scripture say? What does the Bible say? So I'm going to I'm going to talk about money this morning. Is it okay? Yes. yes. Is it okay. No. Uh, I will I will I will cut through a lot of things because this is like a, I can do a week long seminar on this. But I will I will share with you some of the basics. Now the first thing I want to share with you is in Genesis one uh, Genesis thirteen one and two. It tells us how God blessed Abraham financially and how he was very rich in cattle and silver and gold. Now, Abraham was in covenant with the father, and because he was in covenant with the father, the father blessed Abraham. And God said to Abraham, I will bless thee, and I will make thee a blessing. So Abraham was blessed to be a blessing. Everybody say, blessed to be a blessing. Blessed that, is a pur that is the purpose of being blessed, so that you can be a blessing to somebody else. I have three children, and... Uh, um, each one of them, when they graduated high school, they traveled with me. They took a year off before when they finished high school and when they went to college, to university. They all took a year off and traveled with me full time, went all around the world with me during that year. And uh, each year I traveled six times around the globe and they were with me. They went to Africa, Indonesia, they went everywhere. And, uh, and, and you know, and they grew up with a lot of pressure during their childhood. Because there's always people who are, who are not very wise and they come up to preachers' kids and they say, oh, so you're going to do what your father does. And, and they don't realize how much pressure they put on preachers' children. And I have always been very protective of my family. I've always been very protective and I always told my kids, you don't have to do what daddy does, you do what God has called you to do. Amen. And so I remember uh, talking to my oldest son, I said, well, when this year is over, what do you want to do? He said, Dad, I don't feel I'm called to the ministry. Uh, I said, uh, what do you want to do? He said, I think I want to go to university. I said, okay. Now, I said, if you had said you want to go to university, I would have sent you to a good Bible college. Now, now that you want to get an education, I will send you to the best uh, university, private university that I can afford, that we can believe God for. And I want you to get your degree and get a good job, make good money. And I said, and it's not a question of making money. I said, for the purpose that you live for God and make good money so you can give away a lot of money. I said, because remember one thing, you can only give what you have. 
Yeah, yeah, you yeah. cannot give more than what you have. And I said there's three kinds of people in the world. There's people who live beneath the, uh, how do you say, the, the subsistence level. You know, yeah. the government sets an index, you need so much to live. To, to live, and you live, if you live, live beneath that, like a lot of people in England, they go and live on the dole. Is that what you said? Live on the dole? And they live beneath the surviving, uh, you know, the survival index. And what they're doing, when they don't realize when a person goes and collects money, he lives on the dole, he's actually living off other people's money. And when you live beneath that level, you can never give anything to anybody because you're trying to survive yourself. Then the other alternative, the second alternative is that you live on the survival line. When you live on the survival line, you're making it, but you have nothing to give anybody. But when you're living above the surviving line, you know, the survival index, that's when you have something to give to others. And the higher you are above that line, the more you can give. Simple. It's very simple. John Wesley said, 200 years, 250 years ago, he says, make as much money as you can and give away as much as you can. Yeah. Believe God to give away. Live that way. Now, materialism is actually, it actually has to do with the spirit of the world. If you have the spirit of the world, you're going to be greedy. And that has nothing to do with how much money you make. I know poor people who are materialistic. I know wealthy people who are materialistic because they have the spirit of the world. But the spirit of God is all about giving and blessing others. Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. So it's, it's very important that we understand these things. So I told my kids, I said, go and get a good job so you can give away as much as you can. And today my son is 31. He, gives, he, makes, a lot of, he makes more money than I've ever made in my life. But he gives most of it away. He gives a lot of money away. He tithes and, and you know, he, 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 he's a big tither. In fact, our pastor came to my wife once and said, you know, Emmanuel is a big tither. He's a good giver. And you taught him well. Because we taught our kids from the time they were children, they would even tithe out of their pocket money. Right. So now, now they tithe and they give. You know, these, these are good things. We have to learn these things and remember these things. Okay? So God said to Abraham, I will bless you and I will make you a blessing. Now the other thing is that if you read Deuteronomy 28, uh, the first 15 verses will tell you that prosperity, and when I say prosperity, I mean material prosperity is a blessing and poverty is a curse. Right. Yes. Yes. Many white people think, Europeans and Americans, they talk about, oh, you know, those people, I was in Africa, and those people were so poor, they were in rags, but they were smiling and they were so happy. You know, that's one of the, you know, I was at the crusade and those people had nothing, but they were singing and praising God. Listen, their singing and praising God had nothing to them, uh, had nothing to do with what they did not have. You know, that's a stupid thing to say, that we glorify poverty. That's right. As being something that makes people closer to God. It does not. Poverty in the Bible is a curse. Are you with me? I, I say this because I work in Africa. And poor people are not happy. They struggle to feed their kids. So, no. So, let's look at the purposes of prosperity. Are you with me? Okay. The first purpose of prosperity, let's go to... Let's go to Psalm 35, verse 27. I'm going to give you a whole bunch of scriptures. You can write this down. Psalm 35, so you can study these things at home when you get back home later. Psalm 35, verse 27. It says, Let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous cause. Yea, let them say continually, Let the Lord be magnified, which has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. What this verse is actually saying is that God is pleased to prosper those who favor his righteous cause. Mm -hmm. You see that? Yeah. God wants to prosper those who favor his righteous cause. And what is God's righteous cause on this earth today? The number one thing in God's agenda on this earth today is the preaching of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Is that the word of God goes forward and people are saved and people are discipled. It's called the Great Commission. Now, the Great Commission isn't just going to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature like I am doing to these crowds. The Great Commission is bigger than that. 
It says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Then it says, teaching them all things, making disciples of all nations and teaching them all things. So it is to win souls, teach them, and to disciple them. So when you talk about the Great Commission, the Great Commission includes a broad spectrum of different kinds of ministries. It begins with evangelists who are on the field winning souls, and then on the other end of the spectrum, it consists of churches like this, where people are taught, where they are discipled. Now there's different kinds of churches. Some churches exist to make the bishop or the apostle wealthy. Right. If you can't say amen, say ouch. <laughs> Some churches exist just to maintain the status quo. Right. You know, some churches, they don't know why they exist. <laughs> but then there are other churches that say, okay, we want to be part of the Great Commission. Come on now. We want to support missions. We want to support soul winning efforts. Plus, we want to disciple people so that they can be fruitful followers of Christ. Yes. So that whole thing, starting from churches all the way to evangelists, all that, that's called the, you know, that's part of the Great Commission. And God wants to bless those who support these causes. Yes. I have people come to me, they say, you know, I pay my tithes to a church and, and they don't do anything. I say, my question, and they say, what should I do? I say, my question to you is, why do you even go there? <laughs> they, you know, they haven't even stopped to think. I said, there are, I can tell you, you know, good churches in your town that are actually discipling people that are sending missionaries out, so you can go there. And they say, well, you know, you've got to understand my family goes there and my, you know, my uncle is an elder, my father used to pastor that. I said, it's the same as going to a restaurant. And it gives you diarrhea every time you go there. <laughs> and the only time, only reason you go there is because your uncle is the cook. Your father used to be a waiter there. Your, uh, your cousins go there. As any man with half a brain wouldn't go there. Because there's plenty of other good places. Do you understand what I'm saying? We should all be involved in the Great Commission. Of winning souls and making disciples. So that is, you know, that whole concept of the Great Commission, preaching the gospel, getting so that the word of God moves forward in today's evil world. That is the number one thing on God's agenda. And we as Christians should get behind it with our prayers, with our faith, and with our money. So that's the number one thing on God's agenda. That's the number one purpose of prosperity. That's good. So that the word of God can go forth. Now, yeah. the number two reason for prosperity, financial prosperity, is Psalm 112. Psalm 112 says, What time do you finish, Pastor Ben? Okay, I'll keep you in five minute sessions, okay? That's fine. Yeah. Who will give me five minutes? Five, ten, fifteen minutes. <laughs> I want you to do that. So. Psalm 112 says, Praise ye the Lord, blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in his commandments. His, she, his seed shall be mighty upon the earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Then he says, Wealth and riches shall be in his house, and his righteousness endureth forever. And verse 9 says, He has dispersed, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endureth forever. His horn shall be exalted with honor. So the person who is blessed, it says he gives to the poor. Now, uh, let's go to Proverbs 22. Proverbs 22, verse 9. Proverbs 22, verse 9 says that, in verse 9 says, He that has a bountiful eye shall be blessed, for he gives of his bread to the poor. And that's the number two reason for prosperity. The number one reason for financial prosperity, why God wants to prosper his people, is so that we can take the responsibility of seeing to it that the word of God moves forward so that people are saved, people are discipled. That's the number one thing on God's agenda here on this earth. Number one cause of God on this earth. The number two reason is so that we can help the poor. 
He who has a generous eye shall be blessed because of he gives his bread to the poor. Number two thing, God says we must take care of the widows and the orphans and the fatherless. We can't leave it up to the government. You know, we must have this mentality, I'm going to do something about it, I'm going to help the poor. So we should always help the poor. And that doesn't mean only to the church, of course, but I'm saying if you have a neighbor and you see they're poor, bless them. Amen. You know somebody who doesn't have money, buy some groceries for them. Help people in need. When you go to a restaurant, tip the waiters. Yes. And tip them well, Come please. On, don't be stingy. They don't make much money. <laughs> there are people who, have, who work at low paid jobs. Bless them and you'll see how God will bless you. Amen? Amen? Help those who are poor. That's the number two reason for prosperity. Number three reason for prosperity is Psalm 37 verse number four, where it says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Number three reason God wants to prosper you is because he loves you, he wants to bless you. He wants to give you the desire of your heart. Yes. Now here's in, something very interesting about uh, the desires of your heart. Everybody's desires aren't the same. You know, some people like certain things, other people like other things. I had a dear friend, he, he was, I mean, he was such a dandy, you know. Is that the word you use, dandy? Yeah. I mean, his, the, the strap of his watch and his shoes have to match. <laughs> That's the way he dressed. He had these gold tips on his collar and his tie and his underwear matched. You know, I mean, he was, he was, that's how the man dressed. And he had all these suits and, and he was a big giver. And every time, you know, from South Africa, guy was a millionaire. Every time I'd fly into South Africa, I'd be there for three weeks to preach. And he just used to take off, take leave and drive me around and serve me. And I learned never to judge him. Because, you know why? Because, you see, the thing is that, for me, the things that he liked, I didn't like, they didn't matter to me. Yeah. Everybody has his own taste. Right. So you don't judge somebody else. It's between him and God. Come on now. You know? But the other thing I also realized that when you put the gospel first, and you put the cause of helping the poor after that, it does have a tempering effect on what is important to you. Right. I have never, you know, I, 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 you know, let me tell you myself, I never, I never spend money on expensive things. I do have a few nice things, but they've all been given to me by people. I have a $10,000 Rolex watch. Now, I know a lot of people who believe God for those things, who are confessing and speaking Rolex watches over themselves. I've never done that. I've never desired one. I never prayed for one. I never asked God for one. But somebody sent me one. A person I don't even know sent me a Rolex watch. Can you believe that? And I, I wore it one day. My wife teased me. She said, oh, you are now one of those big, short preachers. I said, yeah, I got a Rolex watch, you know? So that gives me some kind of credentials. I said, the only Rolex watches I've worn are, are those $40 fake ones I used to buy in Bangkok on the street, you know? But, uh, but uh, yeah, I should wear them to go to the big conferences. So the ushers should see you coming. Oh, please sit in the front. Yeah, you know, all that stuff. No, I'm just kidding, you know? But anyway, I had this Rolex watch, and I thought I'd try it out for a week. My, I said to my wife, I said, you know, I know preachers who are believing God for these things who actually pray God gave them a Rolex watch. They want it because others have it. I said, I didn't even want it. I got one. I said, I want to see what's the big deal about having a Rolex watch. Now that I have one, I'm going to wear it and tell you in a week's time how it feels. <laughs> well, I wore it for a week. The first thing I learned about the Rolex watch, it speaks the same language as this $100 watch I have right now. <laughs> it speaks exactly the same language. Yeah. Tells the same time. Okay? The second thing was that, you know, I was always afraid someone would steal it or lose it. I would lose it. If someone steals this one, I would say, you know, someone feels good about stealing this, let him have it, I can buy another one. But, 
stealing a $10,000 Rolex watch? I don't know how I would feel. I don't know if my heart could stand that kind of loss. So I, I had it, I had it by my bedside in one of those electronic winders, you know. And the reason I have it, it just reminds me that, you know, God has so much, He can give me anything. But it's nothing that I desired. And the only reason I don't desire it because because giving my life to missions and working and soul winning and feeding orphans, that has had a tempering effect on my own life, Amen. on the things that are really essential and important to me. Really you understand what I'm saying? It's not about things, it's not the price of things. But it's about what makes you tick. So, but the bottom line is, there's three reasons for prosperity. Firstly, getting the word of God forward. Secondly, helping the poor. And thirdly, God wants to bless you with what you need and what you desire. Yes. Amen. Amen. Now, now let me give you the three keys to prosperity. And it is not sending a big offering to my ministry because I have the hundredfold anointing. <laughs> okay? Ouch. The number one key to prosperity, if you, you want God to prosper you, is to live a godly life. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. Yes. Amen. Thank you, brother. Amen. All right, great. Can you say, can you say two more times? Amen. Amen. <laughs> That was six times. Say it one more time. Amen! Just stand there. Seven is the perfect number. <laughs> Praise God. Number one is godliness. Proverbs 22, verse 7. It says, By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Yes. In other words, the Bible says, If you walk a humble walk, before God and before man, you know, some people are humble before God, but they're not humble before man. If you walk a humble walk before God and before man, the result will be riches, honor, and life. That's what the Bible teaches. I want to say this. We must always remember that you don't have to be a Christian to be wealthy. The wealthiest people in England are not Christians. But the word prosperity isn't only about money. Actually, the word prosperity means that it may go well with you on your journey. Life is a journey. And when you embark upon a journey, there's a lot of things that you need. Firstly, that you have a good road map that tells you where you're going to. That's one thing you need. You need a car that actually works, that will take you to your destination. You need pleasant traveling companions and you need to be in good health. You understand what I'm saying? Prosperity isn't only about money. Two nights ago, I switched on TV and there was Tiger Woods. And I looked at him, I said, you know, he was number one, and he messed up his life by his immorality. He still played good golf after his exposure of immorality, but he lost the respect of the people. Now, you tell me, what is the value of money if you have enough money to buy anything you want, but you cannot walk to the streets without people spitting on you or speaking ill of you? But to be able to walk to the streets with the head held high so that people <coughs> can say, you know, there goes a good man. That's why the Bible says a good name is to be chosen above great riches. There's some things that money cannot buy. We have to keep these things in perspective. So the, the Bible says that the blessing of the Lord maketh rich and he adds no trouble to it. So prosperity, we need money. I mean, I'm doing this campaign in Africa. Each campaign cost me $25,000. I need money. I can't just go there and say, I came by faith, I don't have money. You know, we need cash. But it's more than just cash. There's a lot of other things. 
That's why I say if you want God to prosper you, and if you want to prosper by your own wits, fine, do it. There's people who lie and cheat to get money. There's people who go to church. Right? They've been in church on Sunday praising God. Hallelujah. And then on Monday they'll be cheating people. And you and I both know there's people who live that way. Who live by their wits. Is it God prospering them? No. no. But when God prospers you, He will bless not only your finances, but He'll bless your marriage, bless your family, bless your children, bless your health, bless all your relationships, make you a good influence to others. God's prosperity touches every dimension of man's spirit, soul, and body. And so that's why it, it, it talks about that. He said, if you walk a humble walk and live a godly life, you will have riches and honor and long life. Riches is the material. Honor is the soulish and the spiritual. Long life is the physical. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So I tell people, if you want God to prosper you, if you want a good life, live an honorable life. Walk a humble walk. One of the keys to that is contentment. It's not wanting more. Contentment actually means to be free from the desire to have more than what you have. Can you imagine living a life where you say, Father, I'm just so grateful for what I have because what I have is far more than what I had 20 years ago and you have truly blessed me. Now, if you have that attitude, then you're ready to God for God to give you more. Amen. You can't live your whole life always complaining about what you don't have or looking at people who have more than what you have and wish you had. You can't do that. You can't live that way. Contentment. And Paul says that godliness with contentment is great gain. True prosperity is to be happy with what you have and to be thankful to the Father for what you have. Amen. Hallelujah. above what you need is for others. Yes, you are not an owner, but you are a steward. Yeah. An owner is somebody who thinks what he has is his. A steward is someone who believes that what he has is somebody else's, and it is just get, uh, given into his hands to be able to administer yeah. as the owner desires. I'm a steward of God's riches. And I want to be found a trustworthy steward so that the Father can trust me even more, so I can be a greater blessing to people. I want to make my life count for something. Amen? Amen? Amen. You know, I can't take it with me. Can you take it with you? No. 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 I came naked, I'm going back naked. Of course, I'll wear clothes in between, but, <laughs> but I came without naked and I'll go away naked. I've been to funerals. I have never seen a hearse pulling a moving trailer. Do you understand what I'm saying? So just remember that. Number one key to prosperity, live a godly life. Hallelujah. Amen. Second key is hard work. Okay? Proverbs 13. Proverbs 13, verse 11. There's many scriptures, but I'm going to give you one. It says, wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished, but he that gathered by labor shall increase. All right? Yes. You can be like one of these English lords who have inherited a title and a big manor house or something, living ungodly lives, trying to live up a name and a title. And some of them, you know, have six, seven, eight titles, and they actually sell their titles. And there's rich Americans who buy English titles. I'm Lord Fauntleroy, you know. They paid $100,000 for the title. I was actually offered one. And that wouldn't be nice to be called. Sarah called Abraham Lord, and my wife said, forget about it. It's not going to happen here. <laughs> you see, I want you to think of it. Hard work. Now, a lot of people think 
that God is going to bless their lottery ticket. Mm. Or they're going to get into, I don't know if you have them here, but in America we have a lot of these multi-level yeah, things, yeah. you know. I've got a way, I've just found a way how God can prosper you without working. You sit and watch the telly all day. Don't have to do a thing. All you have to do is to sign up two people under you. And they sign up two people under them. And they sign up two people under them. And they will do all the work. And you won't do nothing. And you just end up becoming rich. Let me tell you, it doesn't work. I have met a lot of wealthy people. And I've yet to meet one who has said, I became wealthy through laziness because God blessed me. God blesses hard work. Work hard. I'm in the ministry. I work hard. I don't sit at home sponging off other people's offerings and doing nothing. I work hard. Do you understand what I'm saying? I work hard. I spend half of my year in Africa and third world countries. And the other half when I'm home, I'm gone every Sunday and I'm preaching. And in the weekdays, I'm talking to people, helping people, counseling people. I go to hospitals. I do whatever I'm asked to do because I believe in hard work. I believe that we work for God. We work for the gospel. And I'm not saying work as in the sense of works and grace. Amen. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, Work hard. So I tell people, look, we are all at different places in life. There can be somebody who is a, who's got a big business and who's a doctor, who's a lawyer, has got a good education. Work hard. And there can be somebody who is an immigrant with a low-paying job. Work hard. You know, I used to be an army officer. My father was a major general. I had a lot of respect. I grew up in a wealthy home. We had seven servants in the house. Never made my own bed, nothing. You know, I, I, I was always served my whole life. Lived a life of privilege. And then I went to prison because I, began, I got saved. I was born a Muslim. I got saved. I, uh, I, and uh, I spent a year, all, well, not exactly a year, less than a year in prison. I was tortured. Then they wanted to kill me. So I'm just telling you the story of my life. I had to escape and I came to Sweden as a refugee. Studied the language. And for a short time, I became bivocational. I used to work full time, but also spend full time in the ministry. So my whole, all the time, I was busy with something. So I remember my first job. I worked as did. I worked washing dishes in a restaurant. Very humiliating. I'd never done that kind of work before, but I did it. My second job was cleaning toilets. And that was the first time in my life I became aware of how filthy toilets can be. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. I did that, but, but you know, I, will, I used to complain to God. I'm called, I've never done this, minist- this kind of work before. And, you know, and the Lord said, well, you have to do it. And I said, but I want to be preaching full time. And the Lord said, no, you do this. And you, because I was not paid, I had to do something to support myself. And I said, well, I want a better job. The Lord said, you've never had your hands dirty your whole life. This is the first time. This is your opportunity. And the Lord said to me, you will not come out of here until you're the best janitor this place has ever had. <laughs> so today, nobody in this room can clean a toilet like that. <laughs> I did all the dirty work, mop floors, clean toilets for hours every day. But I worked hard and God blessed me. Whatever, if your job is flipping hamburgers, be the best hamburger flipper that they've ever had. Whatever you have to do, what God puts in your heart, do it with all your heart and God will bless you. Never lie, never cut corners, don't cheat. Never take shortcuts. Come on. Even if you have less money, even if it's low paying, your bills are high, don't cheat on your taxes. Show integrity. Amen? Amen? I know what it is like to have a lower income than the existence level. 
and but I never went to the welfare office to collect the dole. You know why? Because I knew if I did that, it wouldn't bring glory to the Father. Yeah. I never went and collected money from the social office for the simple reason. Because the lady is going to ask me, so what do you do? And what should I say? I'm a minister of the gospel, sitting and begging you for money when I have a God who is, who is bigger than you. Oh. I never did that. But we raised three kids, paid our bills. God took care of us. Work hard. You understand what I'm saying? So number one key to prosperity, live a godly life. Number two, work hard. Number three key after that is giving. Giving, be a giver. I don't understand people who don't tithe. Firstly, because the Bible says we must tithe. The tithe belongs to God. It's not a favor we are doing to God. It's God's tithe. Okay? Then some people say, well, I tithe 5%. You can't do that because the word tithe is an old English word that means the tenth. You can't twentieth a tenth. You can only tenth a tenth. I have yet to meet somebody who has a healing ministry, who is used by God in the supernatural, who says, you know, I'm mightily used by God, by His Holy Spirit, but I don't tithe. I've been preaching the gospel for 39 years. I have yet to meet that person who doesn't tithe and is used by God. Neither have I ever met a person who said, you know, I had financial problems and then I realized the problem was my tithe. And when I stopped giving my tithe, that extra 10% put me over the top and now I'm doing well. Right. I've never met that person. Has anybody met that person? Oh, no. Then I know people who say, well, I don't like to tithe because that's under the law. I'm no more under the law. Well, the law also says you shall not commit adultery. You shall not kill. You shall not covet another man's. Why? You can't say, well, I do those things because they, because they were under the law. They don't apply to us today. I'm under grace. Can't do that. Secondly, if they gave 10% under the law, those who labored and slaved under the law, if they gave 10%, don't you think we should give more? No one there. Because we have so much more to be thankful for. Yeah. Because what they had was bought by the blood of bulls and goats and cows and sheep. But what we have was purchased for us by the precious blood of Jesus. Hallelujah.